know for the first time in a couple weeks, and so I'm, I'm excited and, and ready to keep doing God's work, but it all comes together. If you're listening to that kind of music throughout your week, you're going to be on tune with God, right? In tune with God, on track with God. You're going to be on, on level. You're going to be blessed. And that's what, so I've said this enough. Nobody was doing it this time. I'm not saying this because someone was doing it, right? But I've said this enough. This is part of worship. We're receiving the offering and the pianist or whoever's doing whatever, helping us worship. That's why I've said, don't be talking and messing around. And you're missing what God wants to do. It all comes together. That was beautiful because it pointed us to who God is. Holy, holy, holy. And then what about the songs we sing together corporately? We got a whole hymn book full of songs. I don't just pick out randomly. Sometimes it's just, oh, this is going to be good. Let's be encouraged. And then sometimes, most of the time, it's what does God want to say as we connect it with the message? So it all comes together. And that was just beautiful. And I hope you're hearing what God is saying in your heart this morning. And now part of it is read scripture together. Um, I'll read it and then pray together. Part of what God's doing is we pray together this morning. And then we'll open up the word of God. So Hebrews chapter 2. You can listen as I read Hebrews chapter 2, I want to read verses 9 through 15. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned, all right, we see Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Everything was created for him. Everything was created by him. In bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Sufferings. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified, right? Jesus and us are all of one. For which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. We're part of his family. Saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. Now, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. It's us. He also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Wow. Let's pray together. Lord, as we worship as your people, as we come gathered in your name, we pray, lift up our hearts, and call upon you, Lord, together in this moment, Looking to you, rejoicing in you, amen. That's the first part, most likely right now. We're just so glad for you. The blood that changes our lives, that cleanses us, makes us new creatures. This wonderful song, holy, holy, holy. What a great God you are. So we come to you in this moment in prayer, rejoicing in you. We also come to you together, and this is why we pause and pray together as we worship as the church, because we need you come together now in prayer asking, Lord, that you would do your work in each of our lives. The, the, the needs represented here as we gather in your name are many. And there are others that aren't here that we're praying for that would love to be here. And there are others that we're praying for that don't know you and, and don't have a relationship with you, but we want them to. And so we pray together this morning and ask that you would be at work. We ask that you would help us. This uh, grace that is given in our time of need. So that word need, that word care, casting all your care, that word request, let your request. Lord, there are these burdens that we carry, and so we pray that you would help us. Help us. Whatever it is, doctor's appointments, recoveries, medicines, uh, loved ones that are sick, uh, work-related, Lord, whatever it is, we pray together right now and lifting our hearts in prayer. That you would help us. We trust you. We look to you. We rejoice in you. And we, we call upon you. Lord. Also, Lord, and we'll give you thanks. We will. We'll give you thanks. I, many people will we'll share one with another. 
of your goodness. Will we even take the opportunity in corporate worship to, to bring our sacrifice of praise into the, the temple and rejoice publicly? But Lord, we'll give you thanks. We're, we, we are glad and thankful when you do your work in our lives. Secondly, as we pray together this morning, there's a great work. We, we love coming in here, but we head out. And we want more people to come in here. It's just, this is the burden of the church. We, we, we want more people to have a Savior, to know the Savior, to rejoice in eternal life with us. So, so bless our missionaries. We think of the bushes this week. Encourage them. Use them in their later years. They continue to serve, Lord. May you open the door for them and, and all of our missionaries as the gospel goes into all the world. Because that's what you're doing right now. Use us. We have our missionary mission field right here. We're not missionaries in the sense of going overseas. We're missionaries right here sent out. And we pray that you would use us individually and, and as a church, a, as a corporate body. Lord, use us to reach the lost around us. Help us, uh, help us as we have opportunities to shine our light and to give the gospel. May you be at work through those. Only you can change the heart. So draw people to you, we pray, God. Thank you for this time in prayer. We do want to close in praying for the world, the nation, our nation, but then the world as a whole because we're God's people and we know the answer. And so that's why we pray for our country and for the world because only you can help us. Our eyes are lifted to the hills from whence cometh our help, not to man. And so we pray, God, that you would come and help that you would set up your kingdom and that your will would be done in this world. Thank you for this opportunity to pray as we worship together. Thank you for singing. Thank you for the, for the opportunity to give as we worship you and giving back our tithes and offerings and, the, and the hearing the song being played and then for praying together and the fellowship. Thank you for all this wonderful opportunity we have in worship together. It's all coming together. Now I pray that through your word, your work would continue to be done as we worship in your word now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Young people, you're dismissed to your time downstairs. Let's let the young people be dismissed to their time downstairs. They hear the word of God from their teacher. And let's take our Bibles up here to Psalm number 22. So take your Bible with me now this morning to Psalm number 22. And let's allow God to do his work in our hearts here in our time in God's word. Psalm 22. All right, you see the title on the screen, Life in the Midst of Death. Where does this come from? Where, what's, how did God lead us to this passage this morning? Two very interesting things happen in our fellowship here at Calvary around the celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. You've got to go back with me to Easter, All right? Two events help us see very clearly... And I saw this as a pastor. I just couldn't say anything about it because I broke my jaw. Two events that happened around our celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. These two events help us see very clearly the reality of eternal life in our risen Savior. These two events help us see the meaning of the cross and resurrection. All right? In your mind... Back to Easter. You may not remember. I'm going to tell you anyway because I want us to all get the point. But maybe some of you are thinking about it. All right? Easter, April 20, whatever it was. I can't remember now. 22nd, whatever it was. On either side of that celebration of the resurrection of Jesus, the weekend before Easter and the weekend after Easter, a funeral on both weekends and a missionary on both weekends. Now I'm as a pastor, I'm going, whoa, wow, praise the Lord. So we're celebrating life in Jesus. He's alive, he arose, he arose. And we put two people in the sense of letting them go in the hands of God. They're forever home with the Lord. And we had two missionaries coming and saying, let's reach the world for Jesus. Sandwiched between those two weekends is this wonderful celebration of Jesus dying and rising again to give us eternal life. And so, as a pastor, as the pastor here, as a pastor, and studying the Word of God, God started putting these thoughts together in my mind. Two things that I want us to see together. Number one, our risen Savior gives us hope 
in the midst of sorrow and suffering and death. And number two, our risen Savior gives God's people, the church, a mission and a work to do in this world right now. What two great thoughts God put in my heart and I had to sit on for a couple weeks. <laughs> and I want to share with us as we worship together. This look, we're going to look at the first one this morning. The first lesson today and tonight. And next Sunday night, because it's three parts. And then we'll see the second lesson, the second truth, about the mission through the resurrection. And our missionaries that came and helped us see it around the resurrection when we celebrate the Lord's Supper in two weeks, the first Sunday in June. Which, by the way, we didn't get to do in May because of God's work in my life. God led me to three psalms for the first one. God led me to three psalms during that time of funerals and Easter. All right, so the first thought is, on either side of Easter, we had a funeral. God led me to three psalms. They're a trilogy. Psalm 22, right? Your Bible's open, Psalm 22. Psalm 23 and Psalm 24. They, these three psalms go together. I want to show this to you. All three of them are what we refer to as messianic psalms. You hear the word Messiah in the first part of that, right? All three of these psalms are Jesus pointing. Messianic psalms. They point us to what God would do through Jesus, all right? Let me read the note in my Bible. C.I. Schofield, a commentator on the Bible, he wrote this about these three psalms. Psalm 22, <clears throat> 23, and 24 <clears throat> form a trilogy. In Psalm 22, the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. In Psalm 23, the great shepherd brought again from the dead through the blood of the everlasting covenant. Hebrews 13, verse 20, tenderly cares for the sheep. In Psalm 24, the third part of the trilogy, the chief shepherd. So we have the good shepherd, the great shepherd. Now the chief shepherd appears as king of glory to own and reward his sheep. And that's 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 4. So his note Hopefully, reading that note to you helps us see that, yes, Psalm 22, Psalm 23, and Psalm 24 all work together to give us this beautiful picture of the Messiah, Messianic Psalms of Jesus, of our Savior, right? So, is this true? Look at Psalm 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? We'll stop there. Does anybody recognize that? Who said that? And on what occasion did they say that exactly? Jesus said that on the cross. Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. Or you look at Psalm 23, verse 1. The Lord is my shepherd. Stop there. We'll get to this tonight. That's tonight's study, Psalm 23. Jesus called himself the good shepherd twice in John chapter 10. You can look it up this afternoon and verify it, but we'll see it tonight. Uh, I, I'm trying to get us to see this is exactly what God is doing. Three psalms come together to give us a full picture of our Savior. Psalm 23, Jesus is our shepherd. Psalm 24, we're not going to start in verse 1 on this one. We're going to start in verse 7. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of Glory shall come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. All you have to do is think in your mind to Revelation chapter 19, when Jesus comes out of heaven on a white horse with power and great glory, and the king sets up his throne on this earth. Is Psalm 24 talking about Jesus? Who else is the king of glory? So these three psalms, right, let me, let's bring it all together here as we begin in the study this morning. Life in the midst of death, 
these three psalms point us to Jesus, and it starts with Psalm 22. So go back to Psalm 22 for our study this morning. It starts with Psalm 22, which is a psalm of sorrow and suffering. Verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It is mainly and primarily all about Jesus' suffering on the cross. And doesn't that say something to me? Doesn't that say something to you about what God is doing in our suffering? Folks, there's an answer. His name is Jesus. The cross brings life through death. Yes, God is saying something to us through the suffering that is portrayed for us in Psalm 22. Yes, God is doing something for us through this suffering. He's pointing us to Jesus, who was in all points tempted like as we are. He suffered. I read Hebrews 2 on purpose. He took part of the same. He suffered with us so that he could bring many sons to glory. The captain of our salvation was made perfect through suffering. So this morning, you and I, as we struggle, as we sorrow, as we suffer, as we go through difficulties in this life, you and I can rejoice in a Savior who has gone through suffering and conquered it. And that's why we have hope in the midst of suffering. That's why we have hope. Are you with me? In a funeral for a child of God. On either side of the resurrection, our celebration of Jesus rising from the dead, we said goodbye to two loved ones who knew the Lord. Can we do that as Christians and say, praise the Lord, there's hope? We can because Psalm 22 shows us our Savior suffering for us to conquer death and the grave. It is, Psalm 22 is also something that David had to experience. David is the human writer that God used to give us Psalm 22. He was speaking about Jesus, but David also went through difficulties and sufferings, right? Just like us, we all experience sorrow and suffering in this life. And in those moments of deep sorrow and suffering, God wants us to know that there is hope and grace and strength and victory. Look at verse 22. Verse 1, my God, my God, why thou forsaken me? Verse 22 of Psalm 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. That's Hebrews chapter 2. That's the reference. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Why? Because he lives. The empty grave is the final scene. Not verse 1. Verse 22. Everything turns in this psalm because Jesus stands in victory with the keys of hell and death in his hand. That's why I read Hebrews chapter 2. He became us. He took form of, of, of flesh upon him so he could suffer for us. And he rose again and conquered everything. That is our hope as we go through sorrow and suffering and death. Number one this morning, the first 21 verses point us to suffering and death. I said verse 22 is where everything turns. The first half of this psalm, the first part of this psalm, not really half, but the first part of this psalm points us to suffering and death. We've probably all, we've probably all been at some point in this place of sorrow and struggle and mourning, verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, right? David could say this heartfelt, Lee, he, you know, from his heart, David could say this genuinely, that's the word I'm looking for, because he did go through struggles, and God knows where we are. He knows our struggles. We've all been there. Jesus, though, is the focus, and he went through the same thing. I said it, so we'll say it again. Verse 1 is quoted by Jesus on the cross, Matthew 27, verse 46, so that he can point us to, now think about that. Jesus quotes this so that he can point us and those around him to the answer. Psalm 22 is God doing his work through that suffering. Hebrews chapter 4. You don't have to turn there. Listen to Hebrews chapter 4 and verses 14 through 16. That makes it clear that Jesus 
wants us to know he suffered along with us. Listen to Hebrews 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession of faith, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Hold fast because he's been there, but was in all points tempted. And the word tempted there is not only tempted to sin, though it is, but it's also tried and tested. Suffering. He was tempted in all, like as we are, yet without sin. He didn't fail in the temptation. So, verse 16. Look, because we have a great Savior who conquered suffering. Listen to verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This psalm is a psalm of suffering. Jesus communes with us in our suffering. That's what we're pointing to in Psalm 22. We're pointing to Jesus and his suffering so that he, and here's the thought, can show us the way through. So that Jesus can show us the way through as we look to him and rely on him, the one who has suffered in our place. Number one, verses one through five. God listens when we cry out to him. Look at verse one. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who's he talking to, right? Who's he talking to? God, why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God. Look at verse two. I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. And in the night season, look at what he's crying. At day, at night, and am not silent. I love that verse too. And am not silent. Verse 3. But thou art holy. O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. Amen. They cried unto thee and were delivered. Cried. You see it? They cried unto thee. Help. They trusted in thee and were not confounded. How does Jesus show us the way through? How do we see our Savior in suffering that encourages us in the midst of our suffering and sorrow? Number one, God listens when we cry out. God wants us to cry out to him. God wants us to not be silent, verse 2, and am not silent, verse 2. God doesn't want us to be silent. God wants us to turn to him in our time of need. Jesus, pictured here, on the cross, it looked like it was all over for him, right? And God, listen, God wasn't listening because he stayed on the cross. No, 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 no. God was listening. Verse 3 puts it together for us. Verse 2, why, or verse 1, why are you so far from helping me? Why aren't you hearing me? Verse 2, verse 3. But a, a word that says, in contrast, no, God is at work. Thou art holy. God is. This is our confidence, just as it was for Christ on the cross, just as it was for David and his struggles. God will always be holy. That means he'll always do what's right. The Bible tells us that God does not afflict his people unnecessarily. That's in Lamentations. God does not afflict us. Chapter 3, God does not afflict his people without purpose. God never does anything wrong. Thou art holy, verse 3. That was Jesus' hope. That was David's hope. That was Job's. Job's hope. God is holy. So we can trust in the holiness of God as we suffer and struggle and mourn and sorrow. Because verses 4 and 5, God will always be faithful to his people. They cried to you, Jesus says. Back in the old times, David says it too. They cried to you and you delivered them. Because God is holy. God is doing his work. God's past deliverances give us hope today. The past faithfulness of God encourages our confidence in God's presence and his present faithfulness. The past faithfulness of God encourages our confidence in God's present faithfulness. So cry out to God as Jesus did. How do we make it through sorrow and suffering? How can we follow Jesus' example? cry out to God. God is listening. He's working. He's faithful. He's holy. Number two, God never leaves us or forsakes us. <coughs> Look at verse six. But I am a worm and no man. I mean, this is it for Jesus. He says, 
I, I, I'm done for. A reproach of men and despised of the people. Is that bringing words to your mind? Despised and rejected of men. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. Let God deliver him. Seeing he delighted. Jesus delighted in God. Yeah, let's see if that works for him. Look at verse 9. I love verse 9. But thou, it always turns, doesn't it? But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me to hope when I was upon my mother's breast. Right from the beginning, God, it was all about you. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. So verse 11. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Only you, God. Number two, how can we make it through? How do we follow Jesus? And show, he shows us the way through suffering. Number two, God never leaves us or forsakes us. Jesus was, verse six, despised and rejected of men. He was that tender shoot out of a dry ground that they tried to trample. He was a worm. and no, I mean, this is it. He suffered the lowest form of, of humanity and the highest form reality of suffering. He did that. He was nobody to this world. <laughs> and yet he's God. He was despised and rejected in our place. Philippians chapter 2. It becomes so clear here, doesn't it? I'm a worm and no man. Philippians chapter 2. He thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Because he was God. And yet he took upon himself the form of a servant, humbled himself, and became obedient unto death. This worm is God. And so in his lowness, in his humility, he went to the cross. They, he, was, he was ridiculed, verse 8, 7 and 8. He was rejected of men, and then he was ridiculed on the cross in verse 8. His hope and trust was in God, but the enemy claimed that God would not deliver or rescue Jesus. Was that true? No, God was right there with him. God never leaves us or forsakes us. This worm who was despised of men was being carried, was being carried by God. Was, God was at work in him and through him. Jesus' hope and trust was in God, but the enemy claimed that God would not deliver or rescue him. Here's a thought. I wrote this in my notes. Is our faith challenged when we go through sorrows and suffering and even death? Is our faith challenged? Verse 8, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Is our faith challenged? When we, two funerals, right? When we lay to rest loved ones. I mean, death is final, folks. We don't see him again. It's over, but is it really over? Is our faith challenged when we go through suffering and sorrow? Yes, it is. And Jesus shows us the way through by saying, verse 9, Thou art he that took me out of the womb. He puts his trust in God. Jesus did die, but that does not mean that God didn't deliver him. God wants us to trust him no matter what, because that's what God, because God is doing his work no matter what. Jesus knew where his trust was. That's verses 9 and 10. Jesus knew where his trust was. His life was in God's hands, verse 10. I was cast upon thee from my mother's womb. Right from the very beginning, think about this, right from the very beginning, Jesus was in God's hands. Who tried to kill Jesus when he was born? Herod. Did he, did he succeed? Did he accomplish the task? No. So here's Jesus on a cross being killed. Is God still taking care of Jesus? Is God still carrying out his perfect plan? Did Jesus, did God's work in Jesus' life fail because Jesus died? No. Cast upon the Lord from the very beginning. And that's where we are. Jesus, God never left Jesus. God was with him the whole way. And God was still with him even on the cross. Now think about this. Verse 1, why have you forsaken me but not totally? Because here's what Jesus says at the end. Into thine hands I commit my spirit. Yes, forsaken in the sense that God didn't look upon Jesus because he had the sin of the world upon him. 
but not forsaken because God was still at work. God was still there. I don't know if we'll ever completely understand that. He was forsaken, but not completely. Verse 11. Be not far from me. Amen? For trouble is near. There's none to help. Only you, God. Only you, God. Folks, God will never leave us nor forsake us. God is always with us no matter what we're going through. God will bring us through. God will deliver us. How do we make our way through? How do we follow Jesus through suffering and sorrow? Number one, God listens when we cry out. Don't be silent. Number two, God never leaves us or forsakes us. God is holy in the first one. And number two, we're, we, we're thrown upon God. He's our trust. Number three, God saves us from destruction. In verses 12 through 18, the enemy surrounded Jesus and had their way with him. Look, look, look at these verses. Just listen as we read them. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls. Think about that. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me around. They gape the palm with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. It's not just bulls now. Now we got lions. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a pot shirt. I have no strength. My tongue is... My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. And you can't miss the reference to the cross. It's very clearly talking about Jesus. I may tell all my bones. That means count them. Like you can see them. They look and stare at me. They, verse 18, they part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. So many references to Christ that we can't miss it. This is about Jesus, as David also struggled, but Jesus is the main focus because his suffering shows us the way through. And number three this morning, his suffering shows us God saves us from destruction. Jesus humbly went to the cross. He was in the hands of the enemy. Verses 12 through 18. They had their way with him. Remember that song? We, it's Cromwell, I think, has it in their songbook. He could have called 10,000 angels. Love that song. But he didn't. He suffered at the hands of men for our victory and salvation. Here's the point. Verses 12 to 18. It looked bad. The enemy was definitely prevailing. But look at where it turns. It starts in verse 19. If we don't get to the main thought yet, verse 22. But look at what happens in verse 19. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength. Wait, he said his strength was just dried up. What does he say to God? O my strength. Hasty. Now look at the words. To help me. Number two, look at verse 20. Deliver. Help. Number two, verse 20. Deliver. My soul from the sword might... Darling, from the power of the dog. And number three, verse 21, save me from the lion's mouth. He just repeats all those things he just said. The dogs, the lions, the strength being gone. And he looks to God and says, God, save me. Help me, verse 19. Deliver me, verse 20. Save me. For thou, verse 21, thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorn. So, unicorns. Number three, God saves us from destruction. Was it over for Jesus? Was it the end? It looked bad. I mean, 12 to 18, verses 12 to 18. The enemy, is, he's done for. But God was there. And God would help him, verse 19. God would give him strength. God would deliver his soul from the dogs and the lions. And verse 20, and verse 21, God would save him from the lion's mouth. By the way, the end of verse 21, the reference to the horns of the unicorns. It's not some mystical creature we think of today that can fly on a horse that has horns in beautiful colors. It's not, whatever. You know, don't let the world interpret scripture for you. <laughs> Study the Bible yourself and see what God says. There was a creature created by God. This is the reference. You can do the research yourself. There's a, there was a creature that no longer existed, created by God, that was massive. Almost like an ox, but a couple times bigger than what we think of as an ox. Something that the people would capture and use to, to work their fields that had a single horn. Some have said like a rhinoceros, but bigger than a rhinoceros. 
And this creature was powerful. It was revered. It was, it was, and that's, it was looked at as something that is mighty. That's why the writers of scripture under inspiration point us to the unicorn, the single horned animal that's massive. Don't mess with them. Because it pictures, and here's what I wrote in my notes, it pictures God's power and might. So when Jesus is on the cross, he looks to God and says, You, God, verse 21, will save me because you've heard me from the horns of the unicorns. God hears us from the place of power and authority. It's almost like a stampede's coming. And the enemy's going to be taken over. God would save Jesus through death. So here, let's bring this to a conclusion. The first part, we only have two parts, so don't get nervous. The first part, here's how the first part comes to a conclusion. Suffering and death? Is there an answer when we sorrow and suffer? Is there hope in our struggle and loss and seeming defeat? It, what about funerals? Our hope is in God. He gives victory through Christ. He helps, he delivers, he saves. And it leads to number two, praise and rejoice. How does Jesus lead us through? Number one, through the suffering. He helps us see God's listening. And we cry out to him, God never leaves us or forsakes us. And God saves us from destruction. And number two, how does Jesus lead us through? We come with him to praise and rejoice in the Lord. Everything turns at verse 22. There's rejoicing and praising the Lord as Jesus conquers death and the grave. Look, number one. At the life that we have in Jesus. Verse 22. I will declare. So, so the same one who was just saying, look how bad it is. Look at verse 22. I will declare thy name, O God, unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I what? Praise thee. Why? Verse 23. Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him, and fear him, all ye the seed of Israel. For he hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. I love that phrase, the affliction of the afflicted. <laughs> Neither hath he hid his face from him, but when he cried unto him, he heard. Verse 25, my praise shall be of thee in the great congregation. I will pay my vows before them that fear him. The meek, those like Christ who humble themselves under God's mighty hand and let God do his work. The meek shall eat and be satisfied. They shall, how many times have we seen this? Praise the Lord that seek him. Your heart shall live forever. Number one, praise and rejoicing. We live. It's verse 26, right? Do you see at the end of verse 26? Your heart shall live forever. Is death the end? Is death the end? No! This is what we celebrate at the resurrection. We celebrate a living Savior giving eternal life to us. The first part of this psalm is sorrow and suffering. The second part of this psalm is praise and rejoicing because there's victory. The sorrow and suffering that we face in this life is not the end. These momentary trials will give way to a far greater weight of glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 through 18. Therefore we faint not. Though in this present life we go through struggles and difficulties. Let me read those verses to you. We don't faint because we know there's something bigger coming. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perisheth, our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, the things which are not seen are eternal. The sorrow and suffering that we face in this life is not the end. It wasn't the end for Jesus. It wasn't the end for David. These momentary trials will give way to a far greater weight of glory where we will praise the Lord forever. You guys see how many times praise the Lord comes up in these verses? Through the suffering 
God brings us victory as we stand finally in praising the Lord. We can praise the Lord now because of the victory that we have in Jesus, verse 22. That's what verse 22 is all about. Jesus declares God's name to us. He points us to God's salvation through the cross. That's our hope. It's our confidence. So verse 23, we're the ones who fear the Lord, who reverence God, who trust in God. We put our hope and confidence in him. And verse 24, we see God's goodness and love. Verse 24, he has not despised the affliction of the afflicted. He didn't hide his face from us. He comes to us to deliver us. And that's verse 25. We then praise the Lord again. <laughs> I will pay my vows. And verse 26 sums it up as I said. Our heart lives because he lives. And he gives us life. We eat in victory. We're set. Verse 26, the meek. We eat in victory. We're satisfied with eternal life. We do win. And we praise the Lord for the victory that he gives how does Jesus lead us through? Number one, in this thought of praise and rejoicing, we live in Christ. Our heart will live. Number two, Jesus reigns in power and majesty. Look at verse 27. All the ends of the world. Now, don't miss that. All the ends of the world shall remember and turn unto the Lord. Philippians 2 tells us that every knee will bow. Revelation tells us that every eye will see him. All the ends of the world shall remember this is the one who died on the cross. And turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee, God, before thee, Jesus. Why? For the kingdom is the Lord's. He's the governor among the nations. All they that be fat, comfortable upon the earth shall eat and worship. All they that go down to the dust shall bow before him. The reference is all those who think that they're going to live in victory and make it through, they're going to submit to God. And all those who have died, probably a reference to believers, the meek, they will bow before him and worship him. Everybody will. Look at verse 29 at the end. None can keep alive his own soul. A seed shall serve him. It shall be accounted to the Lord for a generation. They shall come and shall declare his righteousness unto a people that shall be born that he hath done this. <laughs> so you start the psalm with, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? And you end the psalm with, guess who's in charge? Number two, Jesus reigns in power and majesty. Power and majesty. Does this give us hope in our suffering and sorrow and struggles? Does this give us hope? The final note of this psalm of sorrow and suffering is a note of victory, a note of glory. This is why we have hope even in the midst of death. This is why the resurrection means so much. Sandwiched between two funerals, Jesus is worshipped in his glory and majesty. Verse 27, he's the king and governor of all the earth, verse 28. Verse 27, he, he only of the Lord will remember return of the Lord. Verse 28, the kingdom is his, he's the governor. Verse 29, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. That's verse 29. None can keep alive his own soul. We're all dependent on life in him, on life from him. Philippians 2 makes that clear. <laughs> After he humbled himself, God has given him a name above every name. And then I love verse 30. The reference to verse 30 is a seed shall serve him, a generation for the Lord. The church will rise out of Jesus' death and resurrection. You guys with me? The church is that seed, that generation that's given to Jesus. I will build my church. And it's, it's happening. The church will rise in the living Savior. It's given to him for a generation. The, the idea of a generation, don't get just a, a lifespan. The idea of a generation is also a seed. Like he says at the beginning of the verse, it's a, it's a people that are his. It's his heritage. Jesus will have a people, folks. We are that people. Jesus will bring life to all who repent and believe on him, and that's the church, the people of God. Finally, verse 31, the whole world will know that Jesus is Lord. The whole world. He hath done this. 
The suffering leads to victory. Jesus is glorified as King and Lord. Is there an answer? Yeah. In our suffering and sorrow, there's praise and rejoicing. We live in Him. Our heart will live that, that, that seeks Him. And He reigns in power and majesty. And we reign with Him. Death and sorrow and suffering is a reality in this fallen world. As me, for me as a pastor, as I stood there celebrating Easter, the resurrection, focused on that, and seeing two funerals on either end of it. Death and sorrow and suffering is a reality. But in the midst of that suffering is a cross and an empty tomb. We have an answer in the midst of our sorrow, folks. His name is Jesus. We live in Him. He suffered for us so that we could be saved from eternal suffering in hell. So let's praise the Lord. Let's rejoice in Him. Let's say thank you, God, for the victory that is ours in Jesus. Let's pray together. Thank you, God, that you put it together on purpose in our lives. You put the truth together on purpose in our lives to show us, to help us. Help us not miss it. <laughs> Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Lord, I pray that that reminder, that reminder of what happened around Easter has allowed you to speak to our hearts about life and victory, even as we have funeral services. Because God, you, Jesus, suffered and conquered hell and death. And therefore, we have conquering ability in you. We have victory. Hell and death has no hold on us. You have the keys. So deliver us again this morning. If there's a heart that's fearful, if there's a concern about sickness and, and I don't want to struggle, I don't want to sorrow. Lord, deliver us again from the fear of death, from the fear of the struggles of this life. Help us praise your name, Lord. Because in the great congregation, we are your people who have life in you and you lead us through. Help us rejoice, I pray, in the victory. Always rejoicing in the victory that's ours in Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen.